Hi, my name is Harald Sack and this is Knowledge Graphs. Lecture number two, basic knowledge graph infrastructure. In this second section here of the second lecture, we are going to talk about how to represent simple facts with RDF, the resource description framework. So we remember the resource description framework resides at the information exchange layer of the semantic web technology stack. And the basic thing we are doing there is, of course, we want to represent information based on graph. So we know already how to answer that question, how do I represent a simple fact like the following, Spock's home planet is Vulcan, in an intuitive way. Of course, we can do that with a graph. We've seen that already in lecture number one. We have here a subject, a predicate and an object, or a simple graph, two nodes, Spock and Vulcan, connected by a property or predicate, which is called home planet. If you want to express that with a resource description framework, of course all of the things that we want to identify and address here have to be expressed as a URI or IRI. So therefore the subject here, Spock, has to get an URI which denotes Spock, as well as the predicate or the object. And we know already that, of course, we do not only connect here entities one with each other, we also can denote properties of these entities. And these kind of properties usually are values connected to data, to literal. So the object also can refer to a literal besides to URI. And now let's translate this into an RDF statement. Again there we have subject, predicate, here it's referred to as property, and we have object, which also can be a literal value. And you see here already in the RDF uh, n triples serialization that you can use entire URLs or URIs to identify these things. And here you see the URIs are enclosed by angle brackets and this is the way how in RDF you denote that this is a URI. This has to be interpreted as a web address. And the address we have chosen here is the information resource of Spock of the property origin or of the planet Vulcan from Star Trek from DBpedia. So you can also resolve these URIs and see that they make sense and you find some information sources out there. Again, if I denote this as a graph, then I simply, instead of using the names, of course, I'm using the IRIs here instead of that. And one thing you might have mentioned here, what we previously referred to as predicate in a sentence here in RDF, is named property. But this simply has some reasons which come from legacy in relation to logics as well as to avoid further um, dis uh, amb ambiguity. So this is one of the things we uh, will also refer to later on when we go deeper into RDF and also then when we talk about reification. Then it becomes obvious why this is also here not simply called predicate. Okay. Now what we can do in the same sense, we can extend our graph and can denote many facts. For example, we can say, um, yeah, Spock has a creator. Of course, it was Gene Roddenberry who thought of that fictional character. Spock has an affiliation and he's of course affiliated with Starfleet. He has a name, which is here a label, Spock. And also um, he has an origin, which we have also already stated, which is the planet Vulcan. And he was portrayed by Leonard Nimoy and also by Zachary Quinto or Ethan Peck. So these are facts about the entity Spock that we can here express with the resource description framework and here in terms of course of a graph notation. And of course graph notation doesn't fit well into the computer. What we do of course we need another kind of representation. But first let's have a look at the components, the basic components that we need for the resource description framework. Of course, we will need URIs or IRIs that identify and references resources we are talking about. And of course, these references have to be uniquely. And we need literals. We know literals denote not things that have a separate existence of their own. They describe data values and data values don't have such a separate existence on their own. So these are two different things and usually we note it here in our graphs with different kind of nodes. The one are put in ellipse or, or circles and the other one are put somehow in rectangles. Talking about literals, RDF also gives us the, uh, the possibility to connect literals with data types. 
And for that, it borrows simply XML schema data types. So you might have heard about XML schema, and you see here on uh, the right side of the screen, lots of different data types that we might use. And for example, we might use strings, we might uh, use floating point numbers, we might use date and stuff like that. So to do that, of course, you have to identify also the namespace of the X XML schema data types that we are using. And this is this HTTP dub, 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 W3 org 2001 and then XML schema. Then comes a hash followed by exactly the data type that you are using. And you see here, for example, that we have Spock. And Spock here is of data type string. So how do I denote that in RDF? So first of all, all literals usually would come as a character string. And character strings usually are enclosed by double quotes. So this you see here. And then if I want to state explicitly a data type, I used to have here this uh, hat sign twice, and then comes here the URI of the data type that I'm using. And you see here the URI of an XML schema string. Another thing is here, you see here a floating point number, 1161.00, so this is a floating point number. Or you see here a date, this is um, uh, the 2nd of August of uh, 2023, and you see here this is of course type of a date or kind of a date notation. One peculiarity we have also, we distinguish different languages also here, because a, a, a given string here, a given character string can be uh, or can be denoted in different kind of languages. So for example, if I want to express semantic in German, I would simply add behind the character string semantic an ampersand, and then after ampersand, um, the two character abbreviation DE, which is an ISO based standard abbreviation for German. For English, for example, I would then write semantics, again, enclosed in double quotes, ampersand, and then EN, which is the two character code for English. And there are for all kind of languages, for French, for Italian, for Greek, uh, for, for Chinese, for Japanese, there are these uh, two character language texts that you might use for that. Just look it up in the documentation, in the reference manual, and then, then you can see how to do that. So these are literals and data types in RDF. Another special thing that we have besides distinct URIs and distinct literals are so-called blank notes. What are blank notes? Blank notes denote the existing, uh, existence of an individual. And this individual has specific attributes without providing a direct identification or reference. So this is kind of an existential statement, existential assumption. You say here in the example, for example, there exists some entity which has the origin Vulcan and who has the portrayer Leonard Nimoy. However, this is a blank note. We don't say exactly who or what it is. We say there exists something with exactly these kind of properties and it cannot be referenced from outside. So you can't access it somewhere. But of course it's useful and you will also see why and how this is made useful. Okay, and now let's do a formal definition of RDF terms, RDF triples, and RDF graph. So, first of all we have I, which denotes a set of IRIs. Then L is the set of RDF literals, and B is the set of RDF blank nodes. Now let's define the set of RDF terms, which is basically nothing else but the union of all three of them, of I, of L, and of B. An RDF triple by itself, and it's a triple SPO, and that's any element of exactly that set that we define here. If we have here on the one hand the set of the subjects, so that's I, the IRIs, uh, union, the blank nodes, and the set of predicates, and the set then for the object, which is either a, an IRI, a blank node, or a literal. So basically you can say for a triple SPO, subject is only always denoted by a discrete IRI or by a blank node. The property here, or predicate as we might call it, is referred to by an IRI. And the object then you have the possibility to use either an IRI, a blank node, or a literal. And now putting all together you can form RDF graphs. 
an RDF, RDF graph G is then a subset of the set of all potentially available uh, RDF triples. So exactly here an RDF graph is a set simply of RDF triples. These are the basic definitions that we need to go ahead. Now how do I encode, which here is phrased as serialize, these RDF? And RDF here, as you see, comes with, with several different so-called serialization formats. Um, the oldest one and the most simple one is n triples, but of course if you write everything in n triples, we will see that it takes a lot of space and it's hard to read. So therefore, they have invented something which is called RDF turtle, which is an abbreviated form which saves you a lot of writing and makes the things much better understandable and visible. So you will see that turtle is really nice to um, get, uh, uh, let's say, a quick comprehension of what exactly you have defined here in RDF terms. However, it's more difficult to parse than, than n triples and of course um, you can also make lots of mistakes. So you will see that. However, there are many more, so prominent is also an XML version of RDF, but which is again hard to read. There are several other formats like Notation 3 or HDT. HDT is rather interesting because this is kind of a compressed format, so you compress here simply n triples. And there are also versions or serializations which support multiple graphs at once. These are the so-called n quads, so besides the triple notation you always have then quadruples, which means one a constituent then of a quadruple is also the name of the graph you are, uh, uh, you are exactly referring to. There are even things which are called hextuples. You will see that there is RDFA. This is the way how I can introduce RDF into HTML. And the last one here, JSON-LD, this is rather important. JSON-LD of course is a JSON derivative where I can put RDF or encode RDF with the help of JSON. And of course JSON is rather popular for any kind of programming and therefore JSON-LD of course is a really important format here for expressing RDF. However, for sake of simplicity and for sake of understanding, our examples that we see then later on, we will use of course RDF Turtle because this is the easiest way to convey and to learn RDF. Okay, so then in the next lecture we will start with RDF Turtle serialization.